the grand city of Rome, home to some one million, had nearly burned to the ground. Ten of its fourteen major districts and countless ancient sites ravaged in an event known thereafter as the Great Fire. All was desolation, death, and dissipating smoke on the morning of July 29th in 64 AD. Smoldering ruins of buildings and scorched remains of human bodies, half buried in the rubble, were all that remained of most neighborhoods in the city. And the survivors, rich and poor alike, were left on their own, bewildered, to find a way to rebuild their fortunes. Almost at once, people began to recall unusual things that they had seen and heard during the past several days. Some remembered seeing strange men, outsiders, hurling firebrands into buildings. Others remembered being prevented from fighting the flames by persons who seemed to carry authority. And a few remembered seeing the Emperor Nero in the gardens of Mycenaeus singing a song he had set to music about the burning of Troy while the embers danced above his own city. Nero had become emperor ten years earlier, after his mother Agrippina had murdered her husband, the Emperor Claudius, with a serving of poisoned mushrooms. From promising beginnings as a young heir of the Julio-Claudian dynasty, over the years his lust for power, for wealth, for glory, and for cruelty, had grown and seemingly knew no bounds. The list of ruined lives, acts of violence and violation, and even suicides he had personally ordered, was a long one indeed. At the same time, he fancied himself a marvelous singer and entertainer, and demanded the public's applause at every turn. It was Nero who held the power of life and death. In the days following the Great Fire, people recalled that Nero had undertaken some truly extravagant building projects, pushing ordinary citizens out of entire neighborhoods so that he could level them and put up grand buildings and monuments to his greatness in their place. And so it was natural that rumors began to abound that Nero had set the fire himself in order to clear even more space for a newer, grander palace, a golden house, regardless of the cost to anyone else. Nero heard of these rumors and of the people's state of unrest. Expecting trouble in the streets, he summoned his advisors to plan their strategy for dealing with the situation. His earlier circle of advisors, his mother Agrippina, the Praetorian captain Burrus, and the philosopher Seneca, had always guided his actions within the limits set by older and wiser counsel. But that earlier group was now gone, so in this situation, Nero's will to power and his cruelty were no longer held in check by anyone else. Some fifteen years earlier, there had been disturbances in Rome caused by disputes between two Jewish sects. To solve that problem, the Emperor Claudius had simply expelled both groups from the city of Rome, the traditional Jews and the new sect that called themselves Christians. But in the ten years since Nero had taken the throne, the Jewish community, including the Christians, had gradually returned. So Nero and his advisors decided to deflect the blame for the fire away from himself and on to that troublesome group with their strange foreign god, the Christians. This would be the story that all would believe that the Christians had set the great fire as an act of defiance against Rome itself. Nero agreed with the plan and gave the order, and it was done. After all, 
the Christians had caused trouble before, and they were not well thought of. Most Romans did not know any Christians, as they were too few in number. But it was said that they clashed with their fellow Jews over their worship of a man named Christus, a Jewish carpenter. This Christus had been crucified in Judea under the order of the proconsul, Pontius Pilatus, some thirty years before, and it baffled onlookers that the Christians should insist that their god was not simply a character of myth, but a man of flesh and blood, who had actually lived in their lifetimes. And the fact that the Christian god was a criminal in the eyes of Rome made the whole business seem unsavory. In addition, the Christians were rumored to practice human sacrifice and cannibalism as part of their secret rituals. At their rites, it was said, they partook of body and blood together, surely meaning that they ate the flesh and drank the blood of a sacrificed human being. And they would not worship the gods of Rome, only their Christus, a flagrant display of their lack of civic virtue and disloyalty to the whole community, not to mention the risk it might pose should their impiety anger the gods on whom the empire relied for its power. On Nero's orders, the regime made a list of known Christians and sent soldiers to arrest them. These unfortunate souls were tortured and made to reveal the names of other Christians, and within a few weeks, Nero's soldiers had imprisoned a large number of them, including two of their prominent leaders, men named Paul of Tarsus and Peter of Capernaum. Along with the charge of setting fire to Rome, these Christians were condemned for their hatred of the human race and sentenced to death. Those Christians who escaped the soldiers fled from Rome, hiding outside the city in the underground cemeteries and other places dark and desolate. Days later, they heard from eyewitnesses what had happened to their brothers and sisters who were taken, thrown into prisons without trial, and left to the mercy of the prison guards. An entire religious minority was exposed to starvation, beatings, scourging with whips. Many died in the prisons amid the screams, the cold, the darkness, and the filth. Preparations were made for a festival in Nero's palace gardens. The guards prepared their prisoners for the roles that they would play in entertaining Nero's guests as they strolled and sipped their wine among high society. Many Christians were forcibly wrapped in the skins of slain animals to be attacked and then eaten alive by wild dogs driven mad by the scent. Young men and women were hung up naked on tall poles, then doused with pitch to be set on fire in the evening, providing human torches to serve as lanterns for Nero's party. Nero himself dressed up as a charioteer and had his chariot prepared for yet another of his famous theatrical displays, and when evening came, the emperor performed like an actor on a stage and gave his guests their fill of a night's entertainment. But even the loud cheers and applause Nero received from the crowd were not enough to drown out the screams and groans of his dying victims. Other Christians were executed in more conventional ways. Some, like Peter of Capernaum, died a slow and agonizing death by crucifixion, a punishment in his case endured upside down on his own request so as not to imitate too closely the death of his beloved Christus. And a few, like Paul of Tarsus, who enjoyed the benefit of Roman citizenship, were given a swift beheading as a small mercy. For those Christians who heard of these things, who had fled Rome and later quietly returned, they never forgot. For years afterward, they thought of Nero as the very embodiment of evil, of all that was anti-Christus. 
and their shorthand for Nero's name was recorded decades later in the text known as the Book of Revelation, which transliterated in Greek his title, Nero Caesar, into the number of the beast, 666. But the horrors that Nero inflicted on the Christians had unintended consequences. The Roman people, for the most part, had never fully accepted Nero's version of events. They still remembered what they had seen and heard during the days of the Great Fire. Many, no doubt, still suspected that Nero had secretly ordered the fire to be set. And when the cruelty of Nero's punishments went so far beyond the limits required by justice, some of the Roman populace was moved to feelings of pity rather than outrage toward the Christian community. Nero's persecution of the Christians eventually abated, and some four years later, a revolt by one of his generals would succeed in overthrowing him, and the emperor would die at the hands of one of his servants. The Christian community in Rome and throughout the empire continued to grow, facing various levels of persecution at the hands of authorities, but prevailing over the centuries. Some 250 years later, a Roman general named Constantine would win the imperial throne, embrace Christianity, and recognize it as a legal religion, and set the stage for the indelible transformation of Rome into a Christian empire. The memory of Nero's persecution would one day cause a famous Christian named Tertullian to remark that the blood of Christians was the seed of their faith. And so it was. <laughs>